Hello and welcome. I'm Roger Ream, and this is the Liberty and Leadership Podcast, a conversation with TFAS alumni who are making a real impact in politics, public policy, government, business, philanthropy, law, and the media. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Richard Benedetto. Richard is a longtime journalist, uh, including many years with USA Today, and a reporter for other newspapers as well in the Gannett family. He is a professor of journalism, teaching courses at American University and for the Fund for American Studies at George Mason University. Today, Richard will talk with me about his career as a journalist, the news media, as well as his work with students as a journalism professor. Richard, thanks for joining me today. Nice to be with you, Roger. Great. Well, Richard, uh, it's wonderful having you as a professor in our programs at TFAS. So many students over the years who take our journalism program have benefited from learning from a master uh, at reporting. Uh, and so I'd love to get into uh, talking about the media, but first, uh, tell us where you're from. Where were you born and about your education? I was born in upstate New York, central New York, uh, Utica, New York is my hometown. I uh, was raised there, went to high school there, went to the early part of my college career there, uh, and then moved on. But uh, but I uh, came to be a journalist at, at an early age. Uh, when I didn't know I was being a journalist, my <laughs> my grandmother, uh, I, I used to come home from the Saturday matinee the movies, and she'd ask me to tell them, her about the, the movie I saw. And I would tell her the story, and she'd say, you know, you ought to be a writer because you tell the story so well. <laughs> so journalism is telling stories, and that's one of the things I like to do. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so you, you probably had, uh, I was talking to a prominent journalist the other day who said, He's convinced after many years in journalism that being a good writer and a good, like a good storyteller, I guess, is probably more genetic than something that can be taught. He said some people at least just have a natural instinct for storytelling and writing, and it's difficult to teach it. And, and that's great to hear because you evidently had that natural ability. Yeah, there's, which, a, there's, there's that creative part that is, that is innate, you know, yeah. and then there's the part of being a mechanic and that the mechanic part you can teach better. And, you, you know, and the name of the game is to communicate with people and make their writing clear. So you attended Utica College at Syracuse and, and then got a journalism degree at Syracuse University. Uh, tell me, uh, that was many years ago, I know, but what it was the journalism school like for you? Well, it was a, it's a lot different than what it is today, I'll tell you. Uh, there was a lot of rigor involved. And I remember uh, in graduate school, the dean of the college uh, standing on the stage talking to the new students saying, uh, you're gonna go into the news business. Your job is to give people good information. Their job is to figure out what to do with it. In other words, what he was saying to us is you don't have to lead people by the news. Just tell them what you know and, and let them decide for themselves what, it's, what it means. Yeah, that uh, is a change from today, at least the stories I hear of, of uh, journalism schools that are really pushing an agenda. Uh, let me ask this. Have the students that come to our programs that you – teach at other universities and, and see in audiences when you go around the country speaking, uh, are they still have that kind of passion for telling stories and reporting the facts? Uh, or is there, do you find with young journalists today, young journalism students, that they are coming at it more from a political, ideological point of view? I see a lot more of the political and ideological point of view uh, of people who are attracted to the business, not because they want to tell stories, but they want to change the world. And, uh, you know, journalism, you can change the world with information, but the fact is that you don't have to be a, 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 an advocate. You can just tell the story straight and you can it, bring into light the things that are, that are out there that people don't know is a, is a way of changing the world. But the fact is that by doing it, uh, by, by preparing a way of saying, I want to change the world this way, that's a different thing than just trying to change the world. So you'd argue that the, to be a good journalist, you have to be a good reporter. How how how, how odd that is yeah. to hear that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I always say reporting is easy. You go places other people don't go, and you come back and you tell them what you saw and heard. Uh, Just like yeah. talking to your grandmother yeah, yeah, about yeah, the right. movies. People, yeah. people want, but today people want you to not to tell you what editors will say to the reporter. Don't tell me what you saw and heard. Tell me what I what mm -hmm. I want to hear. Mm -hmm. And that's an entirely different thing. Yeah, that's a problem. Well, you you wrote the 
uh, story for the front page of the first edition, first issue of USA Today, uh, covering the White House at that time, right? Yeah. It and, was, well, actually, we weren't covering the White House. The paper hadn't didn't exist, and so we didn't have beats yet. Ah. Uh, and so, uh, but the story had was was a sort of a demographic story, and it was political in its way. It was it was uh, talking about how it, the population had shifted from the Northeast to the South, and that the the, the, the problems of the Northeast were following them. So the, population to the south and so that the new cities in the Sun Belt were having same kinds of problems that cities in the Northeast are having. Oh, that, so, that story is probably still could be written today yeah. and have relevant uh, relevance from people leaving New York and California right. bringing problems with them. Uh, well let me ask you a little bit about your uh, work covering presidents uh, so that means you probably covered presidents from Jimmy Carter to the to uh, I mean well I, I'll say till today because you still write uh, columns, uh, you know, as, as a freelancer, not as a, a reporter for USA Today, but uh, you got any interesting stories to share from some of those, uh, from Jimmy well, Carter, know, Ronald Reagan? I didn't cover Jimmy some... Carter. Uh, I covered Ronald Reagan. Okay. And then Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Uh, Bush, uh, Bill uh, Clinton, uh, George W. Bush. Those are the four uh, presidents yeah. that I covered pretty directly. And uh, and all of them were unique in, in their own way. And then a lot of them had those good stories. But one of the things I, what I remember about Ronald Reagan the most was, that, you know, how, how well he filled the role of being president. When you saw Ronald Reagan, you knew this was the president of the United States. And I remember, what, what I remember very, very vividly is the, the farewell that the military gave to Ronald Reagan when he was leaving office. They had a, a, a military review in the hangar at Air, Andrews Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that hangar was brand new. It was a big, new, empty hangar for the new uh, Air Force One that had been on order but hadn't been delivered yet. It was a new 747 model of Air Force One. But the hangar was uh, brand new and, and empty, and the floor had been freshly painted, and the smell of the paint was still filled in the place. And they had a typical military review farewell ceremony. And I, I remember Reagan standing there, uh, and I was in the press pool. So I was standing probably about 10 feet away from him in the entire, during the entire service. And I remember the Marine Band coming, uh, coming in front of him at the end of the ceremony and marching up to him in front of him, and the drum major saluting the president. Reagan salutes him back, and then the, the band plays O Lang Syne. <laughs> <laughs> and it just brought tears to my eyes. It brought tears to Reagan's eyes, and it brought tears to the drum major's eyes. I could see it. I was because I was that close, and I, it's just a, a memory that it, it sticks in my mind so vividly. Ronald Reagan played the role of president <laughs> so well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, that meant a lot to the public. The public wants to look up and respect their president, and, and, and Ronald, Ronald Reagan played that role well. Yeah, no, that's been a. Uh problem since then with some of our presidents at least uh and of course it seems it seems much more partisan do you think uh our country's become much more divided and partisan like we hear all the time or you know certainly as someone who also remembers the reagan years there were bitter divides back then too but how, well, how what, what's your thoughts I think about it's that become, it, but the 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 partisanship has become more vehement uh you know when go i could think, think back to when i was in college when I was in college, uh, the Vietnam War was on, and uh, and there was a lot of division on that campus. And violence, yeah, yeah, in yeah, the country. Of, yeah, there was a lot of division on campus, and uh, and yet people who were on one side of the war and the other side of the war were still friends with one another. That wouldn't happen today. If you disagree politically with another person in, in college, they're not friends. They won't. The same. You would never date person or Republican never dated Democrat, Democrat never <laughs> Republican. Uh, but we weren't that way, you know, even though there were people who were strongly anti-war during the Vietnam War and strongly, uh, you know, at, for the war, uh, it didn't affect friendships in, in the way that it does today. Yeah, you know, one observation about, the, it comes from this summer, uh, and I'll, I'll see if this is a sense you have, but uh, I noticed this summer our students seemed very serious, not that in past years they weren't, but one morning I was having breakfast with a small group of our students, and I asked them, Are, have you guys been having really heated arguments at night in the dorms about, say, recent Supreme Court decisions and the Dobbs decision had just come out, or I forgot what other issues were hot, but there were some really hot issues going on at the time, and I was 
I almost, you know, knocked out of my seat when the answer from the students was, no, 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 we aren't really arguing. We're just listening to each other and trying to appreciate each other's different perspectives. And I, I view that as partly a reflection of the work we do at orientation to try to tell students, and you reinforce this, that it's important to have friends who have different viewpoints and to have coffee with people who don't agree with you and to listen to other perspectives. You can defend yours better if you've heard the other perspective. And it also might come to respect someone having a differing viewpoint. So I hope that's changing. And I think, but, it, you know, I think that, you know, I teach uh, at American University. Yes. Which is a Washington-based uh, university. Children, the, the students come from all over the country to go to school there. But they almost all think the same mm. politically. They're almost all very liberal. Um, and, uh, and so, therefore, that, it's, it's hard to get a conversation going among the students with, with a different viewpoint. Yeah. So I find That's that I good. have to inject it to try to get it going. Um, and, and, it's, and you know what's it's interesting to me is I teach both journalism students and I teach political science students. Yeah. In different, different, two different colleges within the university. The journalism students are the more partisan ones. At least in the way it, outwardly, they express they feel more comfortable expressing their partisan views than the political. The political science students are a little bit more uh, introspective, and they will we just they'll talk a little bit about it more intellectually, whereas it's not doctrinaire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, from reading things you've written, you know I've I've learned that you know by I'll call it bias in the media or uh, media agenda driven media. Uh, can have impacts in various ways. Obviously, you can write bias into a story and, and not give a fair account of something. But also, you've written sometimes about story selection having a big impact, that you know several major events happen in a particular day, and the media emphasizes one because it furthers their agenda and ignores others. Uh, that seems to happen a lot, doesn't right. it? Yeah, you know, journalism is it's a set of choices. You know, and editors make choices every day as to what's going to be. There's a meeting that says just for the front page. What's going to be today on the front page? Well, you know, that's that's print days. Now, the front page is everywhere. You know, because it's the website is the front page. But uh, there was the meeting. What's going to be on the front page? And everybody would come in from a different department saying, "I've got this story. I've got this story." And then there would be a discussion among those editors. What is the most important? I don't know how those could discussions take place. I, I'm not in a newsroom today, but I don't think that those kinds of discussions in a for, on a formal basis take place like that anymore, so that everybody gets a chance to kick in with their viewpoint as to what, you know, how and which way the story could go, because that's also, you know, well, we talk, kicked it around, and maybe you should take this angle, or maybe you should get this more information on that. I just don't think that that's happening now. Reporters write a story. In fact, I just was talking to a person from USA Today, uh, uh, a couple of days ago, two days ago, and uh, and she was telling me that she hasn't been in the office for two years. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that COVID's but, impacted yeah, this even yeah, further. So, but they don't even. But they don't even. You know, that yeah. that inter that interchange between reporters uh, is is important to discuss things and and kick them around and hear different viewpoints. But that's not going on at all. Yeah, uh, I'm reminded my middle daughter Kelly was in high school here in Northern Virginia, and she was editor of her school paper. So at the time, we were getting the Washington Times, which is more conservative, and the Washington Post at our house, more liberal. And she would look at both papers every morning, and she'd point out to us the, the same story, yeah. but the headline was the opposite in each paper. Right. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it was deficit reduced, and the other one was record deficit, you know. So yeah. both were accurate. But, uh, or, or, you know, that's not the best example, but yeah, they might've both been accurate headlines technically, but, uh, different spin on the same story. Uh, do you see much hope for change, uh, where we can get back to at least the news reporting pages being a little more of the storytelling, reporting the facts and leaving it up to the readers to make judgments? I don't know. I, I, I hope. They said it can change. Uh, all, all I can do as a as a professor is change, light the candles that I can light, yeah. and that's uh, that's uh, it. But it, there's got to be some kind of a movement where we get back to uh, objective journalism, which was really important. Um, 
as, as, the, as the dean said, your job is to give people good information. Their job is to figure out what to do with it. Uh, well, you've certainly had, you're having impact and you've had impact on all these students that you have taught. I know that's true for our programs because they come back to us and tell us how important your course was for them. Well, I find that the students are from TFES who are coming in from all, all parts of the country uh, and attending different colleges are much more open-minded than students who are at one particular university, like say American University or, or George Mason, where they've, uh, they've come from other places, but they still, have, uh, they still seem to have been indoctrinated some way. Um, whether there's a group think that I see that's hard to break through. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's disturbing. I don't know what the answer to the problem is. Yeah, I think that's true. There is a lot of groupthink. Uh, you've also talked or written in the past about when media plays gotcha. You know, instead of, uh, I think a column you wrote once was that uh, it was when the, the Romney-Obama campaign was underway. And you may not remember this particular column, of course, but you showed example after example of where uh, the media wanted to play gotcha with Romney because they didn't want him to win instead of, you know, providing more objective reporting. And that, that game of gotcha, I guess, contributes to this oh, too. Yeah. That, that particular campaign I remember pretty well was uh, uh, at a time that would be the two, 2000, what, 2014, 2012 campaign. I mean, yeah, two, yeah, 2012. yeah that's right. 2012 campaign. Um, you know that was you know, 2008 campaign was kind of a watershed, and that uh, you know it was the first campaign that was run with social media being a factor all of a sudden, and uh, hadn't been up until that time. You know we didn't have smartphones till 2007, mm -hmm. so uh, 2008 campaign was really where the and and Obama learned how to use social media well very quickly, and he had, he had people who were sharp enough to know how to use the social media. Romney didn't use it as well. And so that they really, uh, they were really ganging up on, on him using social media, and and Romney didn't know how to combat it, and uh, and uh, and the press, which was covering the campaign, was you know coming coming into social media era and wanting to play it, so they were paying a lot of attention to what the campaign was putting out on social media, and it was just amplifying it, and it became a it became a wild situation. And just I was saying, I remember saying during that two thousand eight. Of campaign, I, I I could never cover a campaign. I would go crazy. <laughs> just a, it was just too cacophonous. Well, that you've you've raised a whole new topic there, uh, the role of social media, and whether that is going to have a very negative impact on newspapers. It seems like young people today, more often than not, are getting their news from social media. They aren't reading newspapers even online. Uh, I don't know what that, what, what do you think the future of the printed newspaper is? I mean, is there a future there? It, it, it doesn't look, it looks pretty bleak, the printed newspaper. I mean, um, I get three papers delivered to my house every day, the Washington Post, the Washington uh, Times, and the Wall Street Journal. And I look, and I pretty much get most of my news off of the newspapers. It's the old way. I do too. Yeah. And, uh, and so, and I, I, uh, I, but I know that most people are not doing that. And even, and I, I, I just don't know where the older folks, people who are my age, who grew up on newspapers, who are now don't read newspapers because they don't, they're expensive, they don't, they don't subscribe. I don't know what they do. I don't know what, what they're getting, where they're getting their information. Um, television news, I think, is probably the most. And uh, and I just don't think that people are just as well informed because you just can't get that kind of good, solid political information by just using social media. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's bound to be uh, slanted. Shallow and other. slanted. Yeah. And, and, and not, and, and not right. And depending on the site, not even reliable, mm -hmm. you know, be, before you, everybody got, you know, they listened to the radio, they listened to the network news and then they read a newspaper. People knew pretty, they knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's it's kind of a mishmash. Well, I, I had a recent guest on this on the Liberty and Leadership podcast, Elliot Kaufman, who is with the Wall Street Journal editorial page, is uh, edits the letters to the editor, and I confessed to him something my brother said I shouldn't have confessed on the air, and that was that I get the print copy of the Wall Street Journal, but I before I get in the shower every morning, I flip 
their app on and I, they read, they have a, a, uh-huh. a bot, I guess, a, yes. a AI, they, they, they read the, the opinion pieces and the editorials to me while I'm in the shower, which uh, saves me some time. But uh, I don't know what you would say, how I get my news, but uh, I get it read to me. Uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, well, that's from print I anyway. It's yeah, a, it is. It from print. You get the depth it's that the way. Depth. And if you hear something that, you know, especially you could then reread it in the paper that day to get it, to retain it. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, in teaching journalism students, uh, talk a little bit about your, your course for journalism students at TFAS, uh, kind of how you approach it, what kinds of assignments you might make, or I'd love to hear yeah. more about that. I, I, I sort of break it down into coverage of the presidency, cover of country, co- coverage of Congress, and coverage of uh, major issues, foreign affairs and major issues, uh, and uh, and a little bit about polling. Mm. I try to give them a, a smattering of how to be a sophisticated poll reader, uh, which are the reliable polls and which are not the reliable polls. And, uh, and uh, one of the things we talk, I talk about how the press goes about covering the White House and how, how it uh, used to be and then how it is today, and, uh, and give them a flavor of that. And, uh, and, but I, the, all, but the, the common thread that runs through all of that, that I try to string through all of that, is that, uh, that the fairness, give it, telling both sides of the story, uh, trying to be as neutral as possible as you narrate the information to people. Uh, you're not there to persuade them of anything. You're there to tell them what's going on. And, uh, and, uh, so that, and I think the students respond to that fairly well. And, and sometimes it's an eye opener to them because they're not getting it in other courses that they take back home. But I think that, I think that being a, a professor in Washington at a college, at colleges that are based in the Washington area and, uh, and, and seeing, and seeing those students and seeing the students from TFAS who come in from other parts of the country going to other colleges uh, it's a, it's very different. It's very different. The, the students in what they go to school here in Washington from other places, they're very, they become very politicized very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know if they were that political when they were in high school, but, uh, probably because they, they chose to come to oh, Washington, they, they must've had some, but they become very politicized very quickly. Whereas I find that the TFAS students are much more open and, 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 uh, and willing to listen to the other side. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you don't have to be here long before, you know, I, I sometimes, I used to say the local news in Washington, D.C. is the national news. Yes. And, uh, not, you know, obviously there are exceptions to that, but it's a very political town and, and the kids get Potomac fever and uh, drink politics all the time. So uh, uh, you, uh, oh, I was going to say, have you thought, have, do, you, do you touch on now the Supreme Court or covering the Supreme Court now that that's become yeah, such yeah, well, a Well, obviously the, the court has become a, a political, political, it started, you know, the, the politicization of the court uh, became, really came uh, alive with the uh, Clarence Thomas hearings. Uh, or the, the Bork hearings even before that. Yeah. Uh, but that's, and, and it's become politicized ever since. Um, I, I'm, I'm old enough. I remember I was there when George H.W. Bush appointed Clarence Thomas to the court. Yeah. That's now about 40 years ago. Uh, but uh, he, and he did it up in Kenny Bunkport, as I recall. And uh, at the time, uh, you know, he seemed, I remember being, he, nobody knew anything about Clarence Thomas really. And then all of a sudden, you know, he was nominated. He, he was nominated, and, and and along comes the hearings, and along comes the the, 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 the accusations against him, um, a sexual accusation. So you covered that, did you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, and I still remember Clarence Thomas standing there in Kenny Bunkport in front of George H. W. Bush's uh, home in Kenny Bunkport uh, on the Fourth of July weekend, I believe it was. Uh, and uh, and announcing that he was a nominating Clarence Thomas to the court, um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's become quite changed. But uh, I noticed that uh, the last Supreme Court nomination of the of uh, Justice, Justice Jackson, Jackson, yeah, um, is uh, been less politicized. I don't know if it's because everybody's afraid to ta- tackle a black woman uh, and get into the into a battle with it, but it, it was it was less politicized um, than it had been the, the recent ones. Apparently, mm-hmm. I mean, think back to the 
is to think back to the uh, to the uh, most recent uh, Republican nominees that you know fighting that went on. Yeah, it does. It seems I'm I I don't follow the court closely, but that the Republican nominees are in for a rougher treatment generally than the Democratic nominees. But maybe it depends on who's in the majority in the Senate at the time. But uh, of course, we know what happened with Brett Kavanaugh's nomination, and even Amy Comey Barrett was seemed more highly charged hearing than with either uh, Sotomayor or Kagan. But uh, I may not have that right, but that must have been interesting to be there in Kenny Bunkport and to cover that. Uh, uh, what uh, is uh, the status now of USA Today? Pardon my ignorance here. Yeah, USA it, Today, well, it, it, the print edition still goes up, but I don't know, you know, I don't see much of it at all. Uh, I do subscribe to it online, read it, but I find that I get more of my news from the print newspapers that I get in my home almost every day. Uh, Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and Washington Times. Uh, I want the three of those because they 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 run the spectrum. You got Washington Times, wow. which is the conservative paper, the Post, which is the liberal paper, and the Wall Street Journal, which is middle of the road. Wall Street Journal's reporting mm -hmm. is very very good. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's uh, editorial page is conservative, and uh, yeah. but it's it, it's pro I would say it, it's it's less conservative than the Washington uh, Washington Post's editorial page is, is liberal. I mean, they're they're really uh, far left. More you would consider them far left today. Yeah. Well, uh, I brought with me a column you wrote recently, uh, which I wanted to reference. Queen Elizabeth's reign spans fourteen U.S. presidents. Uh, that is amazing. Just the headline yeah. grabbed it, and and uh, uh, she had quite a reign, uh, seventy some years, and. Uh, I don't know that she met every president, but probably. Uh, but what was interesting in this piece is you talked about how much the world had changed. Uh, our lives had changed in those 70 some years. You talked about in your grade school, you listened to her coronation on the radio because TV couldn't broadcast across the Atlantic at the time. Uh, that's great. How, how kind of say something about this piece and, and, uh, and kind of what prompted you to write it was yeah. just well. I, yeah. I I remembered when she when she was uh, when she died. I fr quickly remembered sitting in my fifth grade classroom and listening to it on the radio. Uh, I remember going home, and in the in the evening news did have some film because they were able to fly the film across the oh. ocean and get it to New York. <laughs> and so the evening news had some film of the coronation, but. The only thing that you were we, they were getting on uh, TV during the uh, during the day when the coronation was taking place in the morning, uh, in our morning, uh, was f wire service photographs that were being put on the screen, still photographs of it. But uh, but the thing is that uh, yeah, it, it, what prompted me is that how much the world had changed over that period period of time. We've had all the how many presidents? I say we had fourteen. Fourteen, 14 yeah. presidents in, compared to one. Queen. Monarch, yeah, yeah, and uh, and uh, it's it's uh, and and you know the, the thing is that there there's a certain gentility about that and respect for the office that the British still seem to hold for the most part. A lot less respect for the presidency of the United States. Mm -hmm. We don't hold the presidency in the kind of respect and awe that we once did, and it's kind of too bad. As I think I might have you might have heard this tell this story before is that you know I went to the I was 1950. Uh, two and Harry Truman was in his final years as final years president, and uh, he was unpopular, very unpopular. In fact, his job approval rating was twenty four percent. Wow, <laughs> very <laughs> un that low. unpopular. But uh, I would go on to the Saturday matinee, uh, and the newsreel came on. And when Harry Truman came on the screen, some people in the theater booed. Well, as a ten year old, I was kind of, I was kind of uh, puzzled by yeah. the whole thing. And I came home and I said to my grandfather, you know, Grandpa, you know, I. I was at the theater today, and and the, when President Truman came on the screen, uh, he uh, he was booed, and he turned to me real quick and he put his finger in my face and says, "You didn't boo, did you?" I said, "No." He says, "You don't boo the President of the United States." When he said that, I thought he was giving me a law. Mm -hmm. I thought that was the law. You, <laughs> you might go to jail. Yeah, right. And, you know, Some countries that is a law. I but... knew nothing about politics, and you, you don't boo. What he was telling me was, 
there's a respect that you have to maintain for the author. Now, he was an immigrant. He was an Italian immigrant. Came here as a 16-year-old boy. Uh, and uh, by, at, at 18, he was, in the war, he was in the United States Army in World War I. He, was, he enlisted. And that's how he became a citizen, through his service in the Army. And boy, you never saw a guy who was more proud to be an American citizen than he was. Yeah. And uh, and uh, he was uh, he fought in uh, in World War One in France. He was gassed and carried that gas poison gas in the system the rest of his life. He used to cough that he still had from that. But uh, but boy, he was um, he was never never more prouder American was he. Yeah. And, 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 uh, well, that's wonderful. That's so often the case with immigrants because they appreciate the yeah. But what this country is, offers, I thought that, you know, you don't boo the president. Yeah. The, yeah. You know, you know he, he never lived to see me as a White House correspondent. I wish he had because uh, because he, I know it would have been a meant a lot to him. Well, I, I just recently uh, was listening to Ryan Holiday, who has written a book called uh, Discipline, and he has a chapter in there on Queen Elizabeth II. <clears throat> and one story he told was that in her 70 plus years reigning as the monarch, According to her staff, only once did she fall asleep at a public event, and that was sitting at a lecture on magnets. <laughs> but imagine that. You know, I can't say I've never fallen asleep at a, an event I've attended, but yeah. here's this lady who reigned into her 90s and, you know, would spend hours in the sun greeting people, shaking hands, and she sure performed that role well. Perhaps uh, we'd have more respect for our president if uh, many of them had performed a little better, but I think there's more to it than that. And uh, boy, we could talk for a while about why it is we've, I mean, to some extent, you know, I, I'm glad we don't revere our elected officials as if they are, you know, messiahs and can do no wrong. And, but, you know, the media certainly plays a role in that it, it, uh, while it's, said to be important to have an adversary media that's trying to keep a check on any corruption that might be taking place. Uh, they do seem in that, you know, gotcha mode of what can we find to uh, tarnish this, this office holder, particularly if they don't care for that person. Yeah. So that diminishes the presidency a lot if it yeah, happens it, over and over again. And uh, You know, it, 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 it puzzles me as to why reporters like writing negative stories more than they like writing positive stories. If it's, you can tell good stories, positive stories about things, uh, and uh, and uh, have fun doing it, and inform people. And you know, when I would get more mail back in the days when people would actually write mail to you to, if you wrote a story, I would get more mail about positive stories that I wrote than about negative stories I wrote. People would say, "Oh, it was nice that you wrote about this," or "It was nice you talk about that person who did a good thing." Uh, it's it you, a politician, a reporter will never risk telling us positive story about a politician anymore because they're afraid they're going to be considered soft yeah. or in the tank for that particular politician. So I, when Lamar Alexander, who was Senator from Tennessee, um, pa uh, not past, he's still alive. Uh, he, when he retired from the Senate, I wrote a story about it because he had been, I, I had covered him. He was governor of Tennessee. First. Right. Then he became president of the university of Tennessee. Then he was a two time presidential candidate. Then he became Secretary of Education, and then he ran for the Senate and served three terms in the U.S. Senate. And in through all of that, you never read any story about him being involved in any scandal or anything. But you never knew he was there. He had been in the Senate for 18 years, but you didn't even know. who He was chaired some of the big committees, but who knew who Lamar Alexander was? Um, and he was a very self-deprecating guy himself. You know, he was, he always to tell the joke, you know, he, he ran for president twice and he didn't do very well. He used to always tell the story. He says, well, you know, I was walked into the, some store one day and I said to him, I am Lamar Alexander. I'm running for president. And they, the guy said, yeah, we were just standing around laughing about that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember he wore the checkered shirts. Yeah, right. But, he tell, tell, but I wrote this and I said, danger. This is a positive story about a politician. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I gave him warning to well, would you say it's just that, you know, bad news is what sells papers and, uh, you know, we, we, the plane crash is what you want to read about, not the thousands of planes that land safety safely today. Uh, someone once told me this was some years ago. I know, I don't know if it's true, but that there was a paper in Amsterdam, uh, in the Netherlands that decided they would only run good news. 
and they only carried good stories. I don't know if their circulation went off or not. <laughs> <laughs> they may not be, I'm sure they're not around anymore, but uh, I think you're, that's interesting observation that you get more comments from people when you write positive stories. Uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll share another story. Just, I went to a dinner just two weeks ago here in Washington uh, and it was a, a foreign policy uh, a for, I won't even say who it was, but it was a prominent person who writes about foreign policy. And he gave a talk about uh, making the argument in his after dinner speech that America is not in decline. And he was uh, born in 1950. And he just went through all the times in his lifetime in the past 72 years where we were told America's in decline. Mm -hmm. And he argued that each time the people telling us that were wrong, you know, Sputnik is launched by the Soviet Union. We're behind, we're in decline. And then we land a man on the moon. You know, we had the Civil War riots. We had the Vietnam War unrest that you talked about, but we recovered and, and uh, we passed the Civil Rights Act. We, uh, lots of things changed. And then we had the Jimmy Carter years where we had inflation and lots of trouble that uh, then Reagan came in and the economy was booming in the 80s. And continuing forward to today, just one, one time after another, he said America recovered and moved ahead. And uh, I left that dinner after hearing him saying, wow, this is the first time in a while I've gone to a speech and it's made me feel better <laughs> when I left. And I said, people do want to hear good news. And I think Reagan appealed to many people because he always had such a bright outlook That's on the right. future. He was always optimistic. Morning in America, right? And he's always optimistic and he, he never teared people down. Yeah. He, or it, it, he just, he just, you know, if there was something that he didn't agree with or there's something, he would just say, Oh, that's him. You know, that's this, you know, he just had a way of projecting to the public. He had just had a way of uh, of telling them that everything's going to be all right, even though you might be feeling pretty bad. It was yeah. just a, a gift that you, some people have and some people don't, and uh, he certainly has. And we get so much negativity from the politicians because they're always sniping at each other, and you know they're doing a terrible job, and or they're going to do a terrible job, and you know I think we need more of those kinds of. Uh, approaches of positive, you know, we have problems, yes, but we can solve them. You know, we can move on to greater, greater days and our children and grandchildren can live, live better lives than we did. And you, you, you've talked about, you know, your father having gone to fight in war as well as your grandfather and, and saying he did it so you wouldn't have to. Right. You know, and, and, uh, he used to say that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I encourage people, if you Google Richard Benedetto and Father's Day or Fathers, he wrote, he wrote a great column about, about fathers and, you know, the, the fact that we uh, too often say, oh, fathers today are uh, doing such a better job because they share the responsibilities in the household. And, yeah, they change and diapers. Trying to diminish the, the great work of the fathers of, of your yeah. father's generation. Yeah, right. They, they change diapers, so therefore they're great uh, they're great <laughs> fathers because they've changed diapers. Uh, you know, a lot of fathers that I knew in my growing up were not able to do that because they weren't home. They were working all the time. Yeah, yeah. They'd work, some worked two jobs and, uh, and didn't have time to do those kinds of things. But when they did come home, they did have, do some of those things. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, this, it's somehow or other these other fathers that worked hard all the time but did never change a diaper were not good fathers. Yeah, uh, I can name them, many of them who were. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I looks like we're coming up on uh, the conclusion of this. Uh, I hate to cut it short, but uh, this has been very enlightening. Uh, I wonder if you have any advice to a young person today who might be someone who will be in your class next summer or, you know, is trying to figure out what kind of career to pursue, maybe interested in journalism. You know, what, uh, you know, are the key types of advice you'd offer to someone like that? The first advice I offer to young people is, is you know, to be optimistic. Uh, to, not be, be, let, to not fall victim to being pessimistic or thinking that everything is bad and is going to be worse. Uh, being optimistic is, is a good thing. Uh, looking ahead, saying, as my grandfather used to have a saying, he say, Damani, which means tomorrow. He used to say, tomorrow's another day. You feel bad today. Tomorrow you start all over again. Monty. Yeah, so he would say that. But uh, but the thing is to be to be optimistic and to see, try to find the good in people. There's a lot of good people out there, and uh, and we don't 
play them up very often. As they say, it, it, it's, it's become kind of a no-no to write positive stories about politicians. And, uh, and, and there are polit- positive stories to be written, but we've, we, so we, we aren't even creating for the public any longer a, a, uh, an accurate picture of what the world's really like. And that's, that's a bad thing. Uh, so my, my advice is optimism, uh, looking for the good in people, uh, trying to tell good stories that people need to know, and always remember, you know, where you came from. Yeah. Uh, this idea that, uh, you know, you, you've, you've risen above your upbringing. <laughs> it's, you, know, you know, that you're not, you, you're, you're not back there. You're somewhere else now. Um, where you came yeah, from. I, I, I remember at one of our closing ceremonies, you, you said you should, uh, two things I remember you said to the students was stay who you are and value what you have. Yeah. And yeah. That's yeah. You know, true. where, where you come from and is, is what, is what you are. You know, who you are. And you, and you published a book of columns you wrote when you were working in Utica, your, your hometown where you came from. Uh, for people in mostly, I guess, in Utica, but anyone who wanted to read about it, uh, that's showing that truth of that uh, advice there. Of yeah, remember the co- where you came from. I was, the, the column I w- was writing, weekly column, was writing. I was covering city hall and politics, but uh, but I wanted to write something else that wasn't city hall or politics, and so I came up with this column idea that they went along with, and where I was writing this once a week column, which was a human interest column about people who were. Uh, doing good things, or or just interesting places around town, or new new fashions, or whatever, and uh, and they were quite popular. I'd got more mail and more people commenting on the columns than there was on any of the politics I was writing five days a week. Yeah. But it was fun because you're it was it was a break from the politics, and it was a chance to 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 highlight people who never get their names in the paper, and uh, and that was uh, that was really a lot of fun. Well, last thing I want to ask you, you're, I know you're a baseball fan. You go with students to Nationals baseball games. Uh, this is going to air after the World Series is over, so your prediction will be known to be right or wrong, but do you have a prediction on Phillies or well, Astros? The Phillies, the, the Phillies that, as we speak, uh, are off to a good start. They're off to a two-to-one lead yeah. in the series. And, uh, and I, I'm rooting for the Phillies. because I, I grew up a Yankees fan, but I've become a Nats fan. Uh, but I'm... Uh, I'm rooting for the Phillies for two reasons. One, I I like I always like Bryce Harper, former Nat, yeah, yes, former and, Nationals. Uh, and the other, and the other, the other thing is that I've always held against Houston their cheating scandal. So, <laughs> so those two reasons I'm rooting for the Phillies. Okay, well we'll we'll know when this airs if your 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 rooting uh, interest was successful. But they are up two one, so we'll hope for the best for them. Uh, but very good to be with you tonight, Richard. Uh, thanks so much for joining me. Nice to be with you, Roger. Thank you for listening to the Liberty and Leadership Podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, like, or share the show on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like this episode, I ask you to rate and review it. And if you have a comment or question for the show, please drop us an email at podcast at tfast.org. The Liberty and Leadership Podcast is produced at K-Global Studios in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Roger Reen, and until next time, show courage in things large and small.